Hello and welcome to Angel's Costume Behind the Seams. I'm Jeremy Angel. I'm Jonathan Lippman. And I'm Richard Green. The episode we're releasing today is my interview with Gabriella Slade and Justin Allen. They work together quite a lot in theatre. They've done some live music and it was a really nice interview and the first we've done with two people at the same time. I thought that what came across was very clearly the fantastic collaboration that they had between each other and how they support each other through their separate processes. Mm. And then how they then take their package, their work to the production and bring that into the mix. That's a very important dynamic in terms of how everything moves forward. And um, they seem to have a great understanding of each other and they, they play to each other's strengths in a productive way and not in a uh, competitive. What I find interesting as well is Justin very clearly states he, 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 he knew he didn't want to be a designer, that that wasn't for him. Mm. And it's, it's not always the case with some people when you talk to them, it's, there's always something, oh, I want to do this, or I want to do that. He's very, he knows what he wants to do and he's very happy with it because, and working with Gabriella, it allows him to also do the creative stuff that he does enjoy, but isn't the be all and end all for him. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he's very, he's very much in that, in that sort of, you know, the partnership is, is very mutually supportive and, yeah. you know, they obviously do admire each other. And as you say, Jonathan, strengths and benefits, but Justin knows what he wants to do and he knows what his, his role is, his job is in, in supporting Gabriella in, in her job. It's very good. And the energy that they both display, I think, is, is amazing. I think in terms of, the, of where they are at, in each of their careers as, as compared to somebody that's been in the business for 20, 30 years is that they seem to have a very good grasp of, of the resources and the facilities that are available to them in mm. terms of fabric vendors and makers and suppliers. And I think that that's, you know, w w once, once you've got that understanding, you can mould the work based on that information. I looked at their biographies to see how old they are because I think they must be the youngest people that we've we've spoken to so far and um mm. you know as i say it's 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 an interesting insight into that general that that generation's a, approach to it all which is 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 very refreshing mm. the other thing which with with what you you just said jonathan with the knowing the people and creating this group around them it's things that's been covered as well in interviews to come and some previous interviews like if you think about uh, Kathy Zuber, they have their team and they know they, they've got people that they like working with and they, they work well together and it's they're building a team around themselves to, to allow them to, to go bigger and further. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, everybody makes the point, you know, that this is a pressured job and it never, ever um, eases up. So, you know, you have to know that the team you've got around you are going to support you and going to come up with the goods in, in the time. So it again, keep coming back to this, don't we? Sort of mutual respect, mutual support and you know, working together constructively as a team. Absolutely. And the other thing I, I, I find fascinating, which um, we obviously won't give away any more of the interview before it comes, but one of the piece that they both seem to enjoy the most actually isn't a stage piece, in, as, as it were, in, in what you'd think in, a, in front of an auditorium. One of the things that they made, which I found really interesting, that it's... Um, that was the one they chose as their favourite yeah. and most creative, especially when they've got something like Six, which was very successful for, uh, yeah. for, for her. And, and I've actually been at that location at night for the key ceremony, and Justin's quite right. It is an incredible atmosphere. Well, we hope you've been enjoying these interviews. We've certainly been enjoying getting your feedback. If you have any questions or requests, please email them to podcast at angels.co.uk or you can visit our website, which is www.angelsbehindtheseams.com or you can visit us on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. We are just forward slash costume podcast. And here is my interview with Gabriella Slade and Justin Allen. Today I'm talking to Gabrielle Slade and Justin Allen. Both of them work in theatre and opera, live music, quite a lot of live performance. Gabrielle and Justin, thank you so much for joining me. Thank, thank you for having us. This is going to be our first interview to, uh, talking to two people at once, but the reason we really wanted to speak to you both together is you guys work quite a lot together on a lot of the productions you've done. You've just finished Curtains, Six, uh, the most recent productions that have come out. And I know there's loads more before that, but before we get on to when you guys started working together, if you don't mind, I'd like to just ask both of you, Gabriella, if you want to go first, where did it all start? How did you get to being uh, the designer that you, you are today and working where you work today? So, yeah, it's a really good question, actually. So I guess 
Um, I've always really been interested in clothes and fashion, but actually it probably wasn't until taking sort of art foundation at Wimbledon that I sort of decided to go for the design for performance route, actually. So it was actually quite a late, I guess it was quite a late decision. Mm. It was almost, I actually thought it was a bit of a risk, actually. So when I went to Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in Cardiff and did my degree, it was all very kind of experimental. And I was still, I was learning so many new things. And I actually began to really, really love it. And now I totally love my job. And it was a really, really brilliant training. It was sort of very... Uh, important to learn all of the craft and skills during that time really which has really kind of helped me become the designer I am now and hopefully will become you know in the future grow to be. And the the course was that that was everything so set design as well as costume and everything wasn't specifically just on costume? It was yeah it was set and costume design so um, I do work as both actually Mm. both set and costume design and it, it was just really, really good because it had, you know, it was the courses were like full of tuition and the modules were very interesting. You know, I, I learned how to sew costumes kind of more kind of properly there. You know, I learned passing, cutting, draping on the stand, corsetry, millinery. So I sort of really learned the craft during that time more so than sort of ever before. You know, be- before that I was sort of doing, you know, home, you know, home sewing, you know, mm. sewing to bags and pencil cases and things like that. But obviously... When I went to university, I was able to sort of learn the craft a bit more kind of fully, which was really, really invaluable, actually, for me. It's actually been one of the interesting things that, that that's come out from some of the other interviews is people don't always realise that the theatre in theatre you had two hats of costume and set. It's something I don't think a lot of people realise that you got to look at it from both sides of things and you might be one day in the medium of costume, but the next day you've got to be looking at everything else as well. Does that... Does that does the course prepare you for that, or is that just something you can't be prepared for until the first day of starting one of those productions? I think set and costume work kind of simultaneously. I think it's really helpful that I sort of do both because I think both kind of inform each other. But it's really nice when, for example, a production has a separate set and costume designer. It means you can really kind of focus on the sort of the one area. Um, obviously, I specialise a lot more in costume design only more recently, I guess. And I think it, it's just very useful because you need to make sure that the costumes you design uh, work within the with, work within the spatial design as well. And the spatial design needs to make sh- it needs to kind of make sure there's enough room for the costumes to you know be and mm. have their place as well. So it's it's all a it's all a collaborative effort really in that way. And Justin, how did you start your route into becoming a supervisor? So I when I basically I did drama and theatre studies and double vocational A level in art when I was in sixth form. And I was actually predominantly more interested in going into fashion or interiors. And then I had a bit of a wobble when I was applying for places like De Montfort and London College of Fashion. And then I had a wobble. I thought, no, I need to take a break. So I took a year out and then I did a mixture of placements in uh, interior design and also in costume. And I actually did a placement at Angels uh, back in, I think it was very early 2010. It was a very long time ago now. Mm. And then I decided after really enjoying the theatre ones that I wanted to go into theatre. So I then started looking at, you know, Rex Bruford, looked at a course at Bournemouth in costume making and also uh, Royal Central. So in the end, I ended up going to Central School of Speech and Drama. And predominantly that course is quite renowned in the industry for producing graduates who like to go into multiple different fields, whether that's sort of uh, wardrobe mistressing, dressing, making, costume supervision, your dying breakdown but the course predominantly starts off in costume construction and the first year you have to go through various different modules you do a little bit of fashion history but you predominantly learn the different areas of history by creating the costumes whether that's making mm. you know petticoats or crinolines the corsetry dyeing and after the first year I realized that if I was going to work in the industry as a maker I would probably starve to death because <laughs> I'd never actually finished making a costume <laughs> And then my tutor was like, oh, you thought about supervision? And I was like, oh, no, what's that? They were talking about the course here, just not, not for you personally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, they said, well, maybe, maybe think about supervision. So I supervised my first uh, production in my second year at Central, which was On the Razzle, which is written by Tom Stoppard, designed by Phil Engelhart, who's a, a British designer. And, yeah, I kind of just sort of fell in love with it after that, really, because I... I could still enjoy my main love, which was sort of like working with different people, particularly in relation to picking fabrics. And I realised very early on that I 
my best skills were actually interpreting other people's ideas rather than having the ideas initially, which is why I didn't want to become a costume designer. And I think that's one thing a lot of people say, actually, when they're outside of the industry, you know, whether it's mum, dad or whatever, they're like, oh, so do you design or make the costumes? They don't really know that this person exists. That's one of the things that we're trying to, to sort of get across here. Shelley, Shelley, who runs the training programme here, makes a very good point during her interview, which she says, on a production, whether it's theatre, TV or film, there's one designer, there's one supervisor, and then there's everyone yeah. else. Yeah. And there's so many people. And it's it's the... I say this, Gabby. Please do not take all, take any offence. This, but the the, the be all and end all isn't about just being a designer. There are other careers that you can be successful at, and you can get enjoyment out of. Mm. But it, you don't have to have to be the designer to work in costume or to have a successful career in costume. Well, I totally agree with that. I absolutely agree. Mm. And, you know, and I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to do my job without the people around me, like Justin, mm. working as a team. It's really totally invaluable. And it, and, it, and it's the only way the process works, in my opinion. Well, how did you two start working together? I mean, how did how did that begin? Because I mean, <laughs> you have done you've done quite a fair few productions together. I'm not going to say, oh, it's X amount. You've you've worked quite a few times together. How did that happen? Um, Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> actually, I met Justin only four years ago, around this time, actually. So, and we always laugh because we're like, oh my God, like how many productions have we done in four years together? It's a, it's a lot, it's a lot. But we did this production in, in at the Wales Millennium Centre. It was a new musical called The Last Mermaid. There was a lot of visual medium in that as well, wasn't there? There was a um, video. And yeah, yeah that, it was. That. There was a brilliant projection designer. I think it was Andre Goulding an incredibly ambitious piece of work. It was a piece of new writing. There was a very small, sort of very short rehearsal period and and also a very sort of short preparation period for us. So sort of of really sort of hilariously, we sort of started work and then we sort of realised that this was going to be quite quite a mental project. So Justin ended up moving in my house after a week (laughs) of knowing each other. Um, because I think at the time, Justin, you were still out of London, weren't you? So and yeah, we needed to obviously access, you know, the fabric stores and things kind of every morning, every day. And and we, it was a very, very intense project. It was a brilliant project. You know, Justin and I were up most nights breaking costumes down at 2am, trying to laugh, also probably crying. <laughs> but I think it was, I think it was probably that, that, that kind of maybe made us, the team and the friendship that we have now, really. It was a brilliant and grueling experience simultaneously. <laughs> I don't know if you want to say anything, Justin. But... Yeah, no, it was it was a bit mental, actually. It was a real sort of baptism of fire, and it was it was probably the, the biggest scale production that I had supervised sort of to date. There weren't hundreds of cast members, but absolutely everything was made from scratch. There were these two predominantly different sets of people within the within the it, well, I suppose it was technically a musical, but um... I think it was quite, technically an operetta. It was. It, it was. Oh yeah. It was sort of, it's been referred to in both ways. I think mm. it was but... funny. Cause it was originally aimed at, at, at children, but actually, its subject matter was sort of quite dark, and the design, both from Gabby and uh, Francis O'Connor, who did the sets, was very, very heightened as an aesthetic. But it was really beautiful. We we made predominantly. I think it was around thirty. 30 costumes within the space of about four weeks and they were really really complicated and although that's not necessarily a big number in relation to some of our later projects or even the industry generally you know they were really really complex makes very complex shapes with multiple fabrics that was sort of we couldn't find the fabrics we wanted and the budget wasn't great so we were having to get the makers to actually stitch different fabrics together to create the fabrics and, and, <laughs> and, and it was just absolutely mental and I remember when we relocated to Wales a week before tech I think we were supposed to be sharing the workspace of um, Welsh National Opera but for some reason it didn't happen in the end so we had to go into a building behind the Welsh Millennium Centre and we kind of laugh about it now it was quite traumatic at the time to make <laughs> a sweatshop and we li- I literally had to put sort of 12, 15 tables in in rows and then we had a sewer, you know, a costume maker at each machine and and we were just desperately trying to get ready before, before tech and uh, there was a lot of 16, sometimes even 18 hour days towards the end and it was pretty horrendous and uh, I'd sort of run out like the crazy crazy supervisor getting loads of sweets and, and, and fruit and dumping them on the tables and then doing a haberdashery run and it was we kind of realized I think after that that Gabby and I most of our projects are going to follow a, a similar 
and well, they have. <laughs> um, we've got better. We've got. We've, we have got better. We have yeah. got better. <laughs> yeah. So the tip here is if if you want to find a designer to work on several productions, move in with them for a little bit. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> I think Justin found the status uh, about a week ago. He found it. I think I it, it on page. social media like reminds you of things that happened, you know, in years before. And it was like, you know, the first thing you should do when working with a new designer is move in with them after a week of knowing them <laughs> past the gin. I think that's yeah. it. <laughs> so. You both worked on a lot of productions. The one most recently um, I worked with you in, on was Curtains. And how how do you see the, the division of work between designer and supervisor? I mean, how, how does the, the work get divided between you guys? Because, Justin, obviously you've got an input, as you said, with the, the making side of things, and you like getting your hands dirty. How does that work? I mean, it, generally I think it depends on two things the relationship you have with your designer and also what kind of designer and supervisor you are some designers I've found to be very hands-on like Gabby and we do a lot of stuff together so we'll often visit fabric shops together and play around with the fabrics and and do that together if there's if there's time uh, to sort of influence sometimes where we, the direction we go with the design, even if the design is already established, other designers are very much uh, sort of hands off. And it's not unusual, particularly in theatre, for designers to work sometimes on two, three, and even in really horrendous scenarios, four, four shows simultaneously. And in those scenarios, supervisors very much more... Uh, have to take on a lot of the the work of sort of creating the show, perhaps from the designs and the designs that can go. You might only see the designer once a week. And so when you do have that time, it's really important that you are completely organised and prepared and you've got plenty of options. And, and, and sometimes, like I say, you work with a designer who's more hands-on and actually you then do more of that work together. I'd say that predominantly, though, the main differences between the designer and the supervisor are that the supervisors predominantly more responsible for making sure you don't go over budget more administrative side of the project so organizing fittings between stage management uh, you know liaising with producers so it's very much an organizational role but I think certainly for me I wouldn't be able to do it if there wasn't a creative element to it so I'd say it really just depends on who you're working with and, and what kind of show you're you're working on how that work breaks down really but I ultimately think that designers are the ones that come up with the designs and the supervisors help to interpret and facilitate that work. You got in there first, Gabby, your view. <laughs> well, I was going to say actually that Justin makes a, the most incredible spreadsheets I've ever seen. Like they're just, they're all colour coded and they're all, they're just really, really beautiful, like pieces of work. And, I, and I mean, there's been quite a lot of like feedback about them, hasn't there, Justin, in like, kind of production meetings where they've gone oh my goodness like this spreadsheet <laughs> is amazing I also really really curse the word budget and and Justin mentions it a lot but he he has to mm. <laughs> he has to <laughs> <laughs> I'm like oh no it's a <laughs> having a bad day don't mention the b word and I'm like oh, <laughs> yeah. he's sorry but <laughs> but he, he's very good at saying you know if if we want something he's like well that's 10 percent of the budget and and as you know I I sort of want to drown myself in a bucket <laughs> of chamomile but like you know so but it's obviously incredibly important and you know working alongside Justin is is such a joy and um it's it's really important actually he really is a dream to work with we have quite a very um sort of a very special working relationship I think he's incredibly knowledgeable about design and fabrics and construction we both sort of share that passion so we both get really excited about the possibilities when we're sort of out fabric sourcing or in fittings we have a lovely team of makers that we try and use often and we have a really nice friendship with them as well so I think kind of as a as a unit and as a kind of working practice we have we have a good we have a good time but mostly you know I think Justin like a, he's mentioned it before you know he's so knowledgeable about the fabric side and the construction side that it really helps feed the design the, the getting the designs from the page to to reality really so it's it's great and we're both very hands-on so the load is sort of shared mm. and I prefer it to be that way I, I you know if I can I want to be out fabric sourcing with Justin or shopping but I do leave the organizational side to him <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's great on the phone you know he looks after all the makers and the fittings and so I can have my head in design land if it makes you feel better you're not the first one to say that so you're you're you're, you're okay <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I actually wanted to ask, um, with, with the making and you, the fabric source and everything like that, with a lot of the projects you've done, you've done accurate, completely historical, well, historical accurate pieces. You've done them that are fun and take a little bit of a twist on what people would say is correct and everything. What is your view when it comes to historical accuracy in theatre productions, Gabby, with with what you do? How important is it for you to, or for the costume to be historically accurate? Well, that's a really good question. In fact, actually, I wrote my dissertation on this subject, on this subject matter. (laughs) Oh, wow, okay. (laughs) Where is, let me find it. (laughs) Let me go and read the extra. I absolutely love historical costume. I love period drama. I, I think beautifully made historical costume is 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 just exquisite to see uh, and to see on stage. I think it's good to have both. I, I I think having productions where you can really kind of fuse eras together. You know, something like Six, the musical, is is an example of that, and and something like Curtains. Or you know, we did a project at the Tower of London two years ago where we were able to make a Anne Boleyn costume basically. So it was inspired sort of by information that we could find about what she used to wear we were able to kind of create that garment and 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 actually for Justin and I that was one of our favorite one of our favorite productions to work on wasn't it um it was it was incredible it was a really really special occasion and I think we even hired some of the costumes from from angels for the soldiers for the the voting but um I think it's important to have both I I would I I think there's a there's a definitely a joy in, in 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 sort of both sides I think Justin would probably agree with that as well yeah absolutely and I think the one thing that I would say is that there's not always the money to be completely historically accurate particularly on on theatrical productions where you have to sort of recreate the costumes you you know maybe at the beginning of your career you can't afford to pay for a costume to be made including all the undergarments so you have to think about you know can you cheat and use a bum roll instead of you know like a, a bustle or something to sort of elongate that line and then slightly bigger petticoat or, or whatever but I think the one thing I would say is that why I particularly enjoy working with Gabby is that she really cleverly manages to balance portraying something that is historically accurate but has very much a, a Gabby Slade aesthetic so maybe a, a fabric you know, it may be not 100% natural, i.e. a silk, it might be a silk mix, but then we'll do something different with a pleat. And I think... Or it gent- might be a curtain fabric. Or it could be a curtain That's fabric. What I mean. so, yeah. uh, but I think uh, Nancy, uh, <laughs> with Richard the other day, made a very interesting point, which was that you have to know, you know, the era before you can... Um, uh, mess around with it. But I think that's one of the reasons I massively enjoy working with Gabby is that she manages to tread the very fine line between making something that's historically accurate but is reinterpreted in some way to sort of convey a slightly more niche aesthetic. Mm. A million miles away from historical accuracy and anything like that. Live performances. Justin, you were on um, Spice World as well, yeah. You both did. Yeah, I, I, I've worked with Gabby too. How, how much different was working in the live live environment like that to, to working in the theatre or is it actually more similar than people think I actually think it is do you agree Justin I think it I think it it's it's got sort of I think kind of being a, I think the one thing I realized about the live um, music industry as a process is that it's just much more faster pace basically mm. again we didn't have a very long preparation period and we didn't have for example we would only have a very short amount of access to the sort of the dancers you know we would have sort of one fitting and and we might not see them again for a week um, because they were in rehearsals and I guess you know potentially in theatre maybe you you would have more time with your with your cast uh, you know maybe sometimes it that it really isn't the case but I think it's just a faster pace in general but I actually think it's there are major similarities you know the way we sort of were able to prepare was very similar to to how you prepare for a, a big musical or a, you know a, a large-scale play you know it, it we had a team of makers we had a group of supervisors and you ha- I had me and I had an associate you know I, it for me it was more similar than people probably think. When it comes to, to whether it's hiring or making costumes for theatre, are there other considerations you need to make or you've got to take on board when you're, you're choosing the pieces because of wear and tear and things like that? Or is there a different aspect that you've, you, you've got to sort of put into your design of it, knowing that the, the piece is going to be worn a hundred times in the space of three weeks or something like that? Is, does that add another dimension to it that people probably wouldn't understand or think about or is is it exactly the same principle as making a, a normal costume for one off scene in a film i think justin's great i think you have <laughs> Justin has the answer to um, this, i don't i think the it, word gusset will be mentioned the word gusset will be mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to have a gusset because otherwise you know you're not going anywhere um and i think one of the things that's sort of hardest in 
particularly in theatre, maybe not so much in film, although I haven't got as no nearly as much experience, um, is that quite often you get a period musical and you sometimes get sort of arguments from actors like, oh, I can't breathe in this or oh, I can't move, you know, particularly if it's like a corset or something. And, and certainly for curtains, we very much wanted to have everybody in the correct sort of Victorian corsets. And I think it was sort of week one or two, um, we sort of realised we couldn't afford to put everybody in bespoke made ones. And we wanted to do things like making them out of power mesh so they could move and keep the silhouette. Because it comes back to that comment actually in question about historical accuracy earlier. Gabby and I both very much wanted them to have the historical silhouette. The difficulty with curtains is that they transition between sort of late Victorian and 1950s sort of every other scene so they had to be something they could take on and off quite quickly so they couldn't wear it for the whole thing or if they did had to be comfortable enough to work in the 50s numbers and and sometimes you just don't have the budget or the time to facilitate making things in a way that you know they're going to work so you have to be creative so we ended up finding these um there's a company called what katie did and uh they do really beautiful sort of uh, reproduction underwear for particularly the 1950s and we put them in waspy sort of cinched in their, their ways to give them more of an hourglass sort of uh, silhouette mm. so sometimes you have to get creative particularly when it's difficult with budget but um you quite often have to think about putting in extra gussets under the arms and and then you've got the decision of oh do you do it out of a light crow because that's going to move more but then obviously if somebody in theater is very front row they might see the light crow, like oh it's not a period feature it's a victorian you know blouse or, or whatever so it's something you very much have to consider the interesting thing i would say actually is with six which is probably what uh, one of the things that gabby's probably most well known for designing now the costumes of there's a lot of pvcs and uh holographic vinyls and the first time we we made them we didn't really think about how sort of sweat might affect things like that so actually over a period of months the holographic colours were sort of uh, disintegrating slightly and revealing the whiter base layers of the vinyls and the PVCs underneath. So you, when we remade them the second time round, we had to think about putting other layers of like latex over the top to stop the sweat and the alcohol from um, the cleaning processes from, from eating away. So you try and think about it in advance, but sometimes with all the knowledge in the world, like with six, you just can't anticipate that that's going to happen. So sometimes you're informed post-process which can be irritating from a financial point of view for producers. I think what's been great is so far that adds to one some of the quotes that we've had that you just it's a normal day conversation for costume one of them was okay where's the bird poo going and what's it going to do to the clothes yeah. today it's it's sweating it's degrade the sweat's degrading the the hologram and I've also <laughs> I've also had I need a stage horse with four legs, not two. I mean, these are just random conversations <laughs> that anywhere else in the world make no sense, but for costume, it's completely fine. <laughs> is there, you both hopefully might have different answers, you might have the same answer. Is there one production that you guys, you've enjoyed working on the most? Actually, let me just clear a bit as well. What's the one production you've both enjoyed working on together the most? And then we can ask the separate one, therefore you can both have complete two different answers. Do you want to go first, Gabby? Don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to make a choice, it's fine. I think, I think it's, well, it's so hard to choose, actually. I think I think that's it, because I think six has just been the most incredible process, hasn't it, Justin? I think it's just, it, it the show has just grown so rapidly, and it's sort of this very brilliant sort of machine, really. And I think, I think we've really, really enjoyed working on getting those costumes made, created, developed, to the various productions of six there are now international that production has of course has a very very special place in my heart really but i guess something like i guess something actually something like the tower of london we did two years ago where we were able to make that the Anne Boleyn dress mm. we we look at those we look at those photos now we we actually co uh, commissioned a photographer to take a photo of the the actress in in the in the costume for us because we just loved it that much we didn't really get a, there wasn't really official photography for the production actually um, and it's something that I, we look at now and, and, and we just go, oh, we just loved it so much. So I think, you know, they're very two very different productions, but we both, I think, I think they were two of my favourites, definitely with Justin. I would agree with that. I, I, I quite often think back to being in the Tower of London, sort of at, you know, nine, ten o'clock of, of an evening with pretty much nobody else there apart from the production team. So, you know, 
wardrobe, the actors, stage management, and just thinking how special it was that we were doing an event to commemorate, I think it was the 482nd anniversary or something like that. It wasn't like 500 years, but it was the execution of Anne Boleyn. And for people who don't know, we, the brilliant director, Mark Fentiman, created this uh, sort of event where we tracked Anne Boleyn's journey from Greenwich Palace down the uh, River Thames and she was presented uh, to the tower and then uh, you have the trial of her her execution um, played out in, in the tower grounds. And it really was an incredible experience because I, you just don't get opportunities like that very often and it oh. was such a unique experience and I think particularly for me, I, I absolutely love period costume and particularly sort of uh, very decadent eras and I love things like Tudor costume. I'm not particularly brilliant with contemporary actually because I tend to find it quite boring <laughs> and a bit day to day. So I do enjoy uh, sort of devised contemporary pieces and very much enjoy work by sort of frantic assembly and, and complicity. Yeah, the Tower of London's up there and, and six definitely because it's just such a unique creation and we learn all the time you know we've now made those costumes up for you know in Broadway the Norwegian cruise line and, and every time right, yeah, try well. to learn and develop better ways of the costumes being maintained because it's actually quite hard making practical costumes out of really thick patent back formed PVC funnily enough and getting people to sing and dance in them for an hour and a half so that those were particularly yeah I think two of my highlights but um, I'm still really proud of the little, uh, the Last Mermaid. Actually, that was a really great. And I think we probably ought to mention the Spice Girls as well. I think, <laughs> I, think I think it would be I think it would be daft for us not to mention it. It was you know it was a, a dream project for both of us, and we we both had such a lovely time on it. it. You know it was very hard work, but we were I think very proud of what we were able to achieve. And I, I, I think Justin, you remember this when we we watched the first dress rehearsal of of everyone in costume. And there was this one moment where the the girls, the band came up on this on this sort of riser and and the lights just caught all the Shorovskis we we had on the costume and we just all were like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And 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 I think it was a a, a, a moment I won't really forget. And it was just really great that for me it was really great that Justin was part of that process. So yeah. yeah, that was a well, great it, sounds, it sounds like we should get married or something. <laughs> <laughs> People but, uh, often joke that, you know, Gabby is my, my other wife, but um, we uh, we do work very extensively. <laughs> Um. <laughs> and just just in case people don't know um, what Six is, Six was it is a musical which is about the Six Wives of Henry VIII, which is presented as a pop con concert. So quite nice lead into that from going from the Spice Girls pop concert to to explain what Six is. And it was uh, it it was on Broadway and it was been very successful. And it was a unique take on all the their journeys and who got treated the worst by by Henry, I suppose. It's really bad. <laughs> Yeah. Cliff Notes version of it, but um, no, I thought it was pretty good. Actually, you explained that better than me. Well, what what is it that makes you take a project or a, a job, or is it a case of if it comes up, I'll just take it, or what what is it you look for? If I think I can be super creative with it, I, I it, it excites me immediately. So if I, for example, if I know that I'm probably in my happiest place when I know that we can make costume, probably you know, I I think that sort of drives me really. I think you know. It, it can be a number of things. Mostly, if the script's good, you're sort of halfway there. And I guess the other aspect is is the creative team. You know, you're working with really exciting directors and choreographers who are able to bring kind of their own visual and creative interpretation of the piece. Then that's brilliant too. And and it, it's it's really exciting to work with creatives who are collaborative. You know, if it if it is a musical and you want a nice kind of like result, you have to have a good good dialogue with your choreographer so that the costume design can be utilised effectively. And, and, and look brilliant and, and you also don't want the costumes to be restrictive for what the choreographer wants as well so it, it, it's I think I think there's a there's a, a number of things but I think if I can really put my visual stamp on it that's normally something that that's normally me going yeah I'm gonna take the job. Justin with you what, what makes you draw you to a project? Quite often uh, if Gabby rings and goes oh I've got that I'm like oh great what are we doing next? Um, there are very few projects that um I say no to that Gabby that Gabby offers me but um I get most excited when I know that there's enough money in the budget to <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes, I knew it. I knew it. 
um, the B word. Same, same um, really. Like, I'm the same, though. But, but yeah, Justin, <laughs> yeah, go on. Sorry. Um, <laughs> anything where we can make and involves me fabric sourcing because ultimately that that was the passion really other than sort of storytelling and live performance that got me into working in, in theatre and, and being a supervisor so anything that allows for that I like original and devised pieces which is why I think particularly shows like Last Mermaid were, were so special to me because everything was completely new and, and six in the same way follows that so I think that's probably it really if, if there's there's good opportunity for original making and also uh, you know a decent budget and tells tells a good story really but ultimately sometimes there are jobs that you take on that you make them do or you know you take on for financial reasons but luckily we're in an industry where most of the time we get to pick a job that we want to do rather than because we we have to do it how important is it for what you guys do to have the relationships with the costume houses? It's really important because ultimately, you know, you, you this industry is about working as a team and, and there's very little actually on, on many productions, whether it's, you know, a feature film or, or um, theatre or, or live event that you can do single handedly. And this is an incredibly small cast and maybe, at, you know, perhaps fringe level. You, you need a team of people around you. Um, so it's incredibly important to have a, a good relationship, particularly going back to the B word. If you're if you're struggling <laughs> with a pot of pennies, then you know you need to go to a hire house and say, "Look, Jeremy, I've only got you know four pence. What can we get?" Um, it, it's a <laughs> relationship. Oh, we've been there, haven't we? Yeah. Oh, we've been there quite a few times. Um, not to say that Jeremy's underselling, you know, at all. Um, but I think it's incredibly important and. You have to have a personal and professional relationship with these people because, you know, the hours in the industry are incredibly long. And whether it's, you know, a costume house or a maker or a milliner, a uh, dye house, you have good relationships with these people. Because also, the more you work with people, the more you develop a, a secondhand, you know, uh, language with, with those people. And you can save time and often saving time is, is saving money in the industry. And that's something that's really quite important. Yeah, it's, it's 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 so important, isn't it? Um, and, and actually, you know, when we go to Angels, it's like such a world of discovery in in there. You know, you could be looking for a garment, and and you could be looking for days for this garment. <laughs> but then you'll stum- but then you'll you'll stumble across a sort of a gorgeous 1950s original, which sort of completely transforms your way of thinking. And and that that's what happened on the last production we did with the curtains, and we found this gorgeous silk and shawl cocktail dress which was just like divine and we were in fittings and the lovely alterations team worked their magic and it 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 really was a very beautiful costume on stage as part of that production but yeah I think we we, we're very fortunate to have a lovely working relationship with you guys and we're we're very grateful for that so yeah thank Um, you very much thank you well (laughs) I'll pass get the chocolates and the the wine is on the way yeah (laughs) that that wasn't the reason for the question but thank you no thank you and the final (laughs) question I'd like to ask you both is what piece of advice would you give to anyone who wants to work in the costume industry please go first well I don't I guess it depends on what sort of age group we're talking to really but I'd say that, you know, my main piece of advice would be just try and get as much experience in as many different roles as possible before you, you know, decide that that's something you definitely want to do. Because going back to my own experience again, but um, in A-levels, you know, I very much thought I wanted to do design, whether that be sort of women's wear or, um, you know, costume design or interior design. And partly for that reason was, I guess, I didn't actually know that there are so many different roles that exist. I you know you get like a head of wardrobe to do laundry and whatever but there are so many different roles within the industry and particularly at a younger age although you may not have the right skill set you know you can go and shadow someone or you know get placement experience or or even just send an email and get a few questions answered and you don't have to wait until you're on a course where that forms part of accreditation I'd say you know try and try and do that as early as possible and what else would I say and and don't give up because it is a really tough industry and just because you get into it doesn't mean you're guaranteed a slot you know in the industry life and there's an adage that you're only as good as your last job and sometimes that is true not all the time but um I think really just try and get as much experience as you can and 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 don't give up you know people come into the industry from all walks of life whether it's you know degree-based training 
some people you know might have somebody in the family and then they you know get a leg up that way um, there's lots of different ways to get into the industry and you you nobody can tell you what's right or wrong but a degree can certainly help and experience is in, invaluable really uh, Gabriella it sort of depends who we're speaking to really but I guess if you're sort of like sort of thinking of becoming a costume designer maybe at a young age you know I think le I, I do think learning about the construction and the fabric is really important you know if you think about most fashion designers they learn how to make clothes as part of their study or they were sewing in their youth and you know that way you're able to learn about how fabrics work and move and interact with each other and I think for, kind of from there you can really sort of develop ideas and try new things because you, you, you like you said you know you, you know how to break the rule you know what I mean you know you, you can try um, and be more experimental I think for me that was certainly a really invaluable part of my I guess my training or you know prior to becoming an sort of an industry professional that was so so important you know you'll often find me sort of draping something on the stand or pinning trim and it's it's it's, it's <laughs> good it's good to be with the items and the f and the materials that will eventually create the costume versus it just being like a drawing on the page and I think you've got to have a passion for research I think you've got to know stuff about historical costume about current fashion trends about fashion designers working on something like Six the Musical you know I had to know about the pop industry and what's happening there kind of um, aesthetically but also what 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 Henry Henry VIII's wives were wearing Tudor times and and to have both pieces of information I was then able to kind of fuse them together and I really enjoyed that that research and that process and I think that's also invaluable too so yeah and experience lots and lots of work experience yeah and determination as well because you are going to get knocked back potentially quite a few times before you you get where you want to go and you do have to be prepared particularly with the sort of head of department roles like designer and supervisor you know you're not going to walk straight into being a costume supervisor for a West End musical the day you graduate you know you have to build up that that experience I think definitely just just work hard and study hard and keep open to, to different opportunities and be prepared for really 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 long hours uh, and move in with a designer and well, and move in. <laughs> I guess, I guess one, one more thing before I, I, I don't know if we're finishing but I, I think some of my early jobs that I did were not paid mm. I think that goes that's said for all of us I think because I had the costume construction skill I was able to take on shows early on that meant I could supervise as well as design I could also make as well as design so you know you're, you, when I was still living with my parents you know I would be on like but thank god they're very supportive I would be on a sewing machine at four in the morning just like <laughs> creating like costumes for like a Christmas show with 35 children in it but that way I was able to like do those very very big productions very big. quite early on actually um and, and I think that was really, really a really important part of the early stage of sort of leaving uni. So yeah, so I think it's I think that's good too. I think it, I think having the multiple skills means you probably can be employed a bit more easily, maybe in the initial stages, and then of course you can then specialise yeah. and go. Obviously, I, I don't you know I don't tend to like you know sew anymore, but you know there will be a, you know of course there'll be a Christmas production where I'm like right quick I've got to go and get to the sew machine go go go, and <laughs> and and if you can do that that's great because you can do it and you don't have to you know I don't have to tap on Justin's door and go Justin can you like <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's that's what I would say. Thank you both. Uh, it's I, it's lovely to hear the, well to to hear you talk about each other and what you guys do and. It's been brilliant. So thank you both very much. Thank no, you. No, thank you. It's been it's been great, and we really appreciate the opportunity to have a have a natter together. You yeah, know, it's been really good. Thank you. So Jeremy, that was a really good interview. Very enjoyable and and good questions and and excellent responses from the pair of them. I enjoyed it. They they both bounce off each other so nicely, and I'm glad it came across in the interview as well. It most certainly did. Yes, it did. And we've learned about hologram fabrics. Yes, we have. It's added to the list now. Um, <laughs> doesn't work with sweat <laughs> the next interview we're going to be releasing is jonathan's interview with bart Karras. bart is the designer for the new series white lines he started his costume career at angels we were able to really delve back into how he came into this business and the uh, structure of his early career at food training and selling clothing and fashion 
um, then the people that were around him that gave him the support that he needed in order to develop into the next phase, which was costume design. Yeah, it's an interesting journey because, especially considering that now he's, if you like, up and running and Mm -hmm. uh, functioning as a designer within the television and film world, with a success on his hands because the feedback on white lines for Netflix has been pretty fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it has. What's lovely with this one as well for me is it's the beginning of, there's a group of people who are working quite hard in the industry that sort of were Bart's contemporaries when he was working at Angels. It was a, a really impressive pool of people that, that were, were there at the time and where they are today. And when you hear some of the interviews we've got coming forward, the crossover with all their approaches and the way of learning is really interesting. This this whole series is about examining process mm. and making the distinction that there are so many different ways of functioning and operating and they're all successful. Yes, yes, and they're all essential. Mm. You know, you can't have you can't have a brilliant costume designer if you've got no no backup support with your supervisor in your costume team or your making team or whatever it is. So the whole thing is very, very much a, right. an entity, isn't it? Yeah, and codependent. Yeah, absolutely. There's somebody in the um, theatre supervising world that I've been trying to speak to who just isn't particularly keen on doing it. And it's a shame because I, I think sometimes those people that are reluctant to mm. speak possibly have the most to say. The other thing that I've started to notice is some of the interviews that we've got coming up is the same designers' names keep getting mentioned, the existing designers, the yeah. generation yeah. before, as it were. And it's amazing to hear how high regard that the new wave of designers hold mm. them on and, and also how much help they have received from them. Well, and hopefully inspiring for people that want to come into the business and, yeah. and yeah. give them some kind of roots. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this interview. And now here's a small excerpt from Jonathan's conversation with Bart. And I've got to where I am from observation. I think you knew you said it earlier, observation and listening you know, throughout. So whether it was being angels and, and speaking to the experienced costumiers, then going to work on, on the shooting floor and just absorbing it. You can learn so much from it just being around camera, seeing how, how they shoot it, seeing how people react, learning a completely different language on set.